Well, good morning, church. How's everybody doing? Very good. Very good. We've got some waves. Are there any other waves out there? All right. Thank you, Jay. All right. Yeah, thank you. All right. Hey, you know, we got a lot going on in the church right now. A lot going on. Uh, last week, Pastor David talked about our upcoming, upcoming missions trips. This past Monday night, we had our tribute to Martin Luther King Jr. It was great. We had a great turnout. If you weren't here for it, go to YouTube, type in Mountain View Community Church. You can see it. Uh, really encourage everybody to watch it. It was really well done. Uh, then this morning, we had groups launch. Remember, you can sign up in the lobby if you want to be in a small group. Uh, we've got tonight, we've got uh, the Winter State of the Church Congregation Meeting. We have the best congregation meetings ever. And remember, it begins with a potluck at 6 o'clock. We are bringing Royal Farms chicken, all right? Uh, three pieces of Royal Farms chicken. That's <laughs> maybe a 15, a 12, whatever. So tonight, so, and then we segue to the congregation meeting at 630. We are going to have an historic vote tonight. First time ever in the history of church, we will vote on the campus pastor, Jermaine Keller. So please be here whether you are a member or not. Then next Sunday morning, we start Connect Track. Connect Track is the first three Sunday mornings of every month. It is the first step if you're a newcomer to connect with the church, but it's a step for everyone in the church. So think about next Sunday morning at 11. Then we have, starting February 4th, Mountain View University, MVU. Two classes, Christian Worldview, which ties in great with the sermon today, or Financial Peace University. If you want to know all more about this stuff, it's in your bulletin. You can sign up for MVU in the bulletin, so please look at the bulletin. So that's all that's coming up. And in addition to that, we've come to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 this morning, which is a very daunting chapter. It's 33 verses long. I thought about breaking up into two or, two or three sermons. I thought, no, let's just try to keep this a unit, figure this all out together. It's a hard chapter to figure out. Very interesting chapter. It almost seems more fictional than true. Because we're going to find, we read about a plague that killed 23,000 people one day. Then we're going to read about uh, uh, the destroying angel who comes. And then we read about snakes who bite and kill people. And then we read about drinking of the cup of demons. Snakes, angels, and demons. That's what this sermon is all about. You guys ready? <laughs> Snakes, angels, and demons. I thought about reading the whole chapter since it's a unit, but that took me four and a half minutes when I practiced, so I'm going to spare you of that. Just going to read a few select verses, and then we're going to jump into it. So if you would, stand with me, and let's read a few of these verses, and then we will jump and we'll cover the whole sermon, the whole chapter, in the next 32 and a half minutes. Verse 7, do not be idolaters as some of them were. Verse 9, we should not test the Lord as some of them did. Verse 12, so if you think you are standing firm, be careful you do not fall. Verse 14, my dear friends, flee idolatry. Verse 21, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons too. It's everyone's favorite verse. Verse 24, nobody should seek his own good. 26, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. And verse 31, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. We will not understand that verse until you understand the whole chapter. All right, let's pray. So Lord, right now, a lot of what we're going to talk about this morning may seem irrelevant, but it is very relevant. May we learn and understand what chapter 10 is all about so then we might apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. We are finishing up this section. Chapters 8, 9, and 10 forms this unit called Freedom in Christ. Next week, we jump into chapter 11, a new unit. And that's when we get to the sermon on women wearing head coverings in church. So, are the Mennonites and the Amish correct? Let's find out. And it also talks about men not having long hair either. So, it's going to be a very relevant message it's, um, people were bald, they don't have to worry about anything. But anyway, let's move on. All right, that wasn't in the first two sermons. Okay, my big idea tonight, which is not tonight, it is this morning, is this. And that is, it's all about the heart, okay? You know, everything we're going to cover this morning, it's all about the heart, the heart of worship. Let's look at chapter 10. Chapter 10, verses 1 to 10, is the first section of this chapter. It's about Israel's blessings in the Old Testament. First, it's blessings, and then it's 
tail ends. Verses 1 to 4, I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and they passed through the sea. The cloud, if you may recall your Old Testament, is the pillar of cloud that led the Jewish people by night. And then when they went through the Red Sea, they were delivered. So the pillar of cloud signifies God's guidance. And coming through the Red Sea signifies his deliverance of his people. Verse 2. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and the sea. What in the world does that mean? We remember baptized. The Greek word is baptizo. It's transliterated into English. And it means literally to immerse, to dip, or plunge. However, in a figurative sense, it means to identify. And that's how it's used here. To identify. Because in Exodus 14, 31, it says, When they saw these miracles they did, they put their faith and became loyal to Moses. They've identified mo with Moses as their leader. Verse 3. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them. And that rock was Christ. The same spiritual food, that's the manna from heaven. They came down from heaven six days a week, 40 years in a row. The same spiritual drink, the rock that poured forth water in the beginning of their journey. Then there's a rock near the end of the journey that came forth water. And all of this, though, this bread or this hardtack, right? The, the manna and the water, their source was Christ. And this points to Jesus in John 6, 35. It said, I am the bread of life. He who believes in me will never go hungry. In John 7, 37, 38, if you believe in me, Jesus said, out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Jesus is the source of the river of living water spiritually and the source of your sustenance spiritually. This all points to Jesus Christ, Jesus in the Old Testament, even when his name isn't mentioned in the Old Testament. And so God's provided supernaturally for them, and yet <clears throat> he wasn't pleased with most of them. Verse 5. And nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. So remember, they came through the waters of the Red Sea. They're on their journey to the Promised Land, but they had a snafu. Two spies went out to spy out the promised land. Actually, 12 spies went out. They came back. Two said, we should go in. Yeah, there's giants, but we should go in. Ten said, no, we can't. The giants are too big. They influenced the, the rest of the people to not to trust God. And as a result, 40 years later, the only ones who entered the promised land were the two spies, Joshua and Caleb. Every other adult who came through the waters of the Red Sea perished in the wilderness. Children who grew up entered the promised land, but all adults perished other than Joshua and Caleb. This building was built in 2010. Imagine if 40 years from now we built another church building and there were only two adults left from 2020 who went into the new building. Who would those two adults be? Probably my wife and I, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> would have buried a lot of elders in those 40 years. And maybe a pastor as well. But anyway, let's move on. So th let's go look at the fall, verses 6 to 10. The fall. Now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. If you have your own Bible, underline that verse. To keep us from setting on our hearts, our hearts on evil things. This, I think, is the theme of the whole chapter. Not setting your heart on evil things, as they did. How did they? Verse 7, Paul says, Do not be idolaters, as some of them were, as written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. That refers back to the incident of the golden calf. Moses up on Mount Sinai. He doesn't come down for a while. They're like, where's Moses? We need a new God. They throw their gold together. Poof. How comes this golden calf? Oh, our God now to lead us. That was idolatry. Verse 8. We should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 of them died. In one day, 23,000 of them died. 
Numbers chapter 25 talks about the Israelite men who indulged in sexual morality with Moabite women. And then the women invited them to the sacrifice of their gods. They said, yeah, okay, why not? And they bowed down and worshipped Moabite gods. And then one day, God wiped out 23,000 of them. Verse 9. We should not test the Lord. We should not test Christ as some of them did and were killed by snakes. Numbers chapter 21, they begin to complain against God, against Moses. We hate this detestable food. We hate this bread. We don't have any water. We hate the wilderness. Let us go back to Egypt. And God got tired of them griping against them. So he sent these snakes and they bit people and some of them died. Now I know we, there was no photography 3,500 years ago, but this week I did covered one picture of the snakes. Here it is. <laughs> you didn't know Indiana Jones was Jewish. Anyway, the snakes came and they bit the Israelites in the desert. Verse 10. And do not grumble as some of them did and were killed by the destroying angel. Can't wait to meet him in heaven, the destroying angel. I don't know if it's Gabriel or Michael. It just doesn't say. That context was in number 16. They grumbled against Moses and Aaron. and God sent the destroying angel. God was unhappy. He blessed them and then they still fell. What happened to be so blessed in this position of victory and triumph to then fall and they're all wiped out in the desert. Idolatry of two kinds we see in this text. First, some of them devoted themselves to the worship of false gods, the action of actually worshiping false gods. And second, the attitude I don't want God, I don't want Moses or Aaron or God ruling over me. I don't want anyone ruling over me. The heart that you don't want anyone over you, pride, self-sufficient independence. I can be my own God, and that is idolatry. And so Paul takes those 10 verses and applies it in segue to Corinth, verse 11. He says, these things happen to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us. Verse 12, so if you think you are standing firm, take heed lest you fall. Great verse. So if you think you are standing firm, anybody in this room thinks, I've arrived, man, I am standing firm, I've got it all together, you are already on the way down. And the fall will be hard and long. The person who thinks he's standing on his own is already on his way down. And therefore, you are now ready to succumb and fall into temptation. Verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will provide a way out so that you can endure it. They are in danger of falling into temptation. What is the sin that they're about to fall into? It's the sin of idolatry. And how they're about to engage in idol worship. First, a few things about this verse. This is a great verse. You find yourself in a situation. You go to work tomorrow or work on Tuesday. You go back to school or you're at college or whatever situation you find yourself in. You're between a rock and a hard place. You're tempted to do what you shouldn't be doing. You're tempted to have an affair. You're tempted to cheat at work. You're tempted to this. You're tempted to lie. Whatever you're tempted to do, you're between a rock and a hard place. God says, no, 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 no. There is no excuse. I don't care how tight that squeeze is, but there is a way out. There is always a reason why, an open door to find yourself to get out of that situation and step into the light. No, let no one say, I'm being tempted beyond what I can bear. God will provide a way of escape. And, and Paul's saying, Corinthians, you have a way out of what you're about to engage in. God is faithful. You just have to look for that door. Now, in context, you may think, and Pastor David did a great job of chapter 8 a few weeks ago. I thought chapter 8 said, well, you can eat meat sacrificed to idols because there's no such thing as an idol. Why is Paul bringing it back up again? Yeah, you can eat meat sacrificed to idols, but... Now they're about to engage in a greater degree of apostasy. It brings us to verse 14. 
Therefore, my dear friends, flee from idolatry. He gives you examples in verses 15 to 17, 18, and then he applies it to their situation. First, verses 15 to 17, communion. We call it communion, the Lord's Supper. Verse 16, is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we drink, for which we give thanks, a participation in the blood of Christ, is not the bread we break, a participation in the body of Christ, because there is one loaf. We who are many are one body, for we all share the one loaf. In the Jewish Passover, there was a cup called the cup of blessing, a cup of thanksgiving. Jesus inaugurated the Lord's Supper at the Last Supper. We don't have to Passover feast anymore. We remember on a weekly, regular basis, sharing in communion, remembering the body of Christ, the blood of Christ, eating the bread, drinking of the cup. And that is a sharing in. The Greek word participation really is fellowship. It's a fellowship with Christ. And see, it says one loaf, though you're many. So in here, I'm going to just take a guess. We got 425 people in here. So there's a lot of people in this room, but in two weeks, if you're all back when we share in communion, all of us, though we're many, will share together as a one unit, as one body of Christ, the Lord's Supper, the ordinance of the church are being carried out by the local church. And when we come together, we come together as one, although we're many, and we do so as an act of worship to God. Communion is an act of worship to God. You're remembering what Jesus did for you. Verse 18. In the Old Testament, though, they bring an animal sacrifice. They slit the throat. They, they scatter the blood. They offer the fat on the altar. Verse 18. Consider the people of Israel. Do not those who eat the sacrifices participate in the altar. What he's saying is those who, after they offer the, the animal sacrifice, you could then, as an offer, eat some of the meat left over. And in so doing, with the priest, you participate in this one act of worship in the temple. Communion is an act of worship, offering the sacrifice an act of worship. Therefore, now, Corinthians verse 19, when you get ready to do what you never, ever should do, you need to realize you're engaging in an act of worship. But with who? 19 to 22. Do I mean then that food sacrificed to idols is anything or that an idol is anything? No. There is no such thing as an idol. There is no other God. There is only one God, as we just sang, three in person, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There is not a second or third or fourth, or a millionth God. They do not exist. But the sacrifices of pagans are offered to demons, not to God. And I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons too. You cannot have a part in both the Lord's table and the table of demons. Are we trying to arouse the Lord's jealousy? What he's saying is this, and that is, an idol is nothing because there is no other deity and no other human, dead or alive, who acts as a god on behalf of God. But these pagans believed in their pagan gods and as such their worship of pagan gods in place of the true God. And Paul says this is inspired by demons. So in reality, demons, not gods, were their objects, were their objects of idol worship. The people in Corinth didn't know that. They thought Zeus was a god. They thought Aphrodite was a god. They thought Apollos was a god, but really it wasn't. It's, it's all made up. And who, who invents that there are many other gods that you need to appease and worship? Well, behind the scenes, that's Satan. That is the work of the devil and of demons deceiving the whole world. And he says, so then do not go into this temple and eat. And that's what they did. They walked across the street, opened the door, they went into the temple, and then they sat down and began to eat the meat offered to the idols. And they entered into the worship of these false gods or demons. And Paul says that is what you never, ever should do. So, verses 23 to 30, let's summarize this and then get to the point. To eat 
or not to eat first. If you go to a meat market in Corinth, where they're selling meat that was sacrificed to idols, remember, the temple is on broad and first. The meat market is on broad and second. You just walk across the street. You leave the temple, and then you can go buy the meat. You can go to the, the meat market, and you can buy the meat, because there's no such thing as an item. Anyway, so buy it and eat it. Second, if someone invites you into their home and offers you meat that had been sacrificed in the temple, if they don't bring up a question or objection, eat it, because there's just no such thing as an idol anyway. But, no such thing as an idol anyway, but you cannot enter into the pagan temple and participate in an act of worship of pagan gods and eat the meat there. That's why you never, ever can eat in the pagan temple. We just covered 30 verses in like 17 minutes. Uh, now I can breathe and slow down. Why can you never ever eat that meat in a pagan temple? Because 1 Corinthians 10.31 says, So then whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. You cannot give glory to God in a pagan temple. That is impossible. So there are two errors were first. Why? Did these believers allow themselves to go into the pagan temple in the first place? And second, how come they could not resist eating of the meat? Why didn't they just say, no, I'm not going to do this. I just wanted to look around. That's the problem. When you go and you start to look around, and the next thing you know it, you're offered to eat. It's hard to run out of the house once you've already walked into the house you never were supposed to be in in the first place. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? Flee idolatry. You see, when your heart goes to the wrong place, you can be led to any place. You can even be led to an idolatrous place. So how does all of this apply to us today in 21st century Frederick County, Maryland? I think, again, the command to us is to avoid idolatry. And I want to share with you what I believe are the two gods of idolatry to avoid. First God is the God of deception, and the second God is the God of discontentment. The two Ds, deception and discontentment. First, gods of dis deception. Always avoid the worship of another god. So I was I Googled the other day, came up with the 15 most famous or worshipped deities. Number 15, Koetlike. I don't think I'm pronouncing that right. This is the, I don't have a slide, but there he is right there. The multifaceted, the multi-faced she, the multi-faced goddess of the Aztec mythology of Aztec civilization of central Mexico. Supposedly the creator and destroyer of the world, the mother of gods and mortals, she is said to have given birth to the moon and the stars. I'm sure this statue is, looks nice and neat, but there is no mother goddess that exists. Zeus, the god of sky, thunder, law, and justice. Then there's Athena, the Greek virgin goddess of intelligence, arts, wisdom, and peace. My favorite one, number 12, is Odin. Odin, in Norse mythology, uh, the supreme god recorded from the period of the Vikings, the Minnesota Vikings, um, not the Minnesota Vikings. But anyway, his worshipers declined in the course of time. But Odin now, Norway is now returned in some places to worship their gods like Odin. There's Vishnu, the most important deity of Hinduism. And then, you know, Hinduism has 33 million gods. And then number one, as is fitting, they mention our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the only God. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. He is the bright and morning star. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. He alone is God. He alone is to be worshipped. Even when you fell at the face of an angel in the New Testament, said, don't worship me, worship God. Jesus is God in the flesh, so worship only him second. Don't fear any type of little of God, small g, God. What I mean by that is I've got a picture of spirit houses. Pastor David was telling me about this in Thailand. They have these, out in Thailand, it's very popular to have these little 
spirit houses. This one's outside of a private house. To keep the spirits out of your private house, they have erected these spirit houses. So the spirits enter these spirit houses and they then do not bother you. We see another one outside of a business, a spirit house, because you want to make money in your business, right? You don't want the spirits bothering your business. And third, you know what they love to drink? They set up red Fanta in these spirit houses. The spirits, I've been told, love red Fanta. Red is associated with animal sacrifice, blood, but they, Fanta must be doing a killing in Thailand. And, and they leave them out because if the spirits come, they drink of the red Fanta, and then they will not come into your house. It's all about appeasing these spirits who are ghosts. And again, let me just say this. You don't have to agree with me, but I'm right. There is no such thing as a ghost. There are angels and demons, but there are not people who have died, and after death, they're floating around. They're not in the Battle of Gettysburg. They're not up there. There are no ghosts. There's no ghost in the land and house. Everyone who's died is either with the Lord in heaven or away from the Lord in another place that you don't want to go to. That's where all human beings are. There's no floating human beings anywhere. There are no ghosts. So you don't need to be afraid of the spirits because they don't exist. These ghosts do not even exist in the first place. Third, don't pray to rely on man-made idols. God said, you shall have no other gods before me in the Ten Commandments. You shall not make for yourself a graven image or bow down and worship it. Do not pray to a statue. Do not use an amulet. Do not use a rabbit's foot. Um, Somebody asked me last night about this. They asked me about crystals and things like that. And first, let me explain. I don't have a cross in my pocket. I used to have. I've got one of those mint papers here. But uh, I had a mint. Got to have a mint. But if I had a cross in my pocket, it's a simple reminder to me that Jesus died for me, but it's just a reminder. If I, take, if I took that cross out of my pocket and I held it and I relied on it, um, you know, if I don't have the cross in my hand, my prayer is not going to be as effective without the cross in my hand. No, no, that's just idolatry. Your prayer is just as effective with or without a cross in your hand or around your neck because you're not trusting in a cross. You're trusting in the one who rose from the dead from the cross, right? Jesus Christ. You go straight through God. You have bold access to the throne of grace and help in time of need. Hebrews 4.16, you don't need that. So, it's okay to use it to remember, but if it's an aid to help you, you don't need that. Um, I don't know if I want to get into crystals, but I don't know enough about them. I think anything that you take, any kind of drug you take, any kind of legal drug you take for your health is good. Right? Legal is a key word. Um, drink honey in your tea. Um, it's okay to use something for your physiological health. That is one thing. But anything you use to be a spirit spiritual guide to harness spiritual energy for you. You don't need that. You have all the Holy Spirit in you if you're a Christian to begin with. You don't need to harness the spiritual any that is somewhere in the universe. That's all. It's all bogus. You don't need that. All you need is a relationship with the one and true and living God. Amen? That's all you need. Fourth. Well, let me just uh, add an example. Years of, five years ago when Leaf, Leaf and I, Randy Colbert we in Cuba, we were evangelizing. I was in one home, and the, the, the man and woman were listening, and they had parts of a Bible, only like a third of the Bible, shared with them how Jesus died and rose for them. If they just call on Jesus' name, they'll be forgiven, and they have, don't have to worry about anything. And they were so interested, and he said, wait. He went to a corner of his room, picked up these idols, went out in the alleyway, put on the ground, and just stamped on them and crushed them. It was so awesome. Came back in the house and said, my wife and I now want to give our lives to Jesus. And they did right there. You don't need to rely on man-made idols because they're not what God wants you to have in the first place. Fourth, do not trust in an exalted person. Never, ever, 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 ever pray to anyone other than God. There's no one in heaven that you need to pray to. There's no other mediator between God and men than Jesus Christ. So there's no exalted person you need to reach out to. Jesus is the ascended God-man. So keep that in mind. And then fifth, don't desire to become a God. In the New Age movement, 
people are trying to tap into their spiritual nature and evolve into a God and one day become an ascended master, supposedly like Christ. You don't need that. In Mormonism, they hope one day to become gods in the next life. No, no one else can become God or a God. There is only one God who is eternal, who had no beginning, has no ending, and he will not share his glory with another. He is God. These are the gods of deception, and deception is all over the world. Just take a mission trip. Bless you. Just take a mission trip. When your heart goes to the wrong place, it can be led to any place. So when Lori and I were went to Israel last year, and uh, we spent a day in France, we went through Notre Dame, and it was really cool. Notre Dame was amazing. Loved every bit of it, but it wasn't more holy in Notre Dame than it is right here in Mountain View Community Church. And we met in the high school for 13 years. It's not more holy in this building. It was over in the high school. Um, and it's not more holy to worship God in the high school than it is to worship God in my house. First century, they had house churches. What did Jesus say when you pray? Go into your inner room. Go into your closet. <laughs> you know, it, it's, not, it's not more holy here than in your closet, unless it stinks in your closet. Go into your closet and pray to your father. Your father who sees you in secret will reward you. You can worship God anywhere and everywhere because he does not dwell in houses made of human hands. He is omnipresent. He's all-powerful. He's all-knowing. He is God. Amen? And you can worship him. Now, on the other side, I think the error we tend to go towards is the gods of discontentment. The God of power. I want to be the strongest and the richest and the mightiest and the greatest. If you're one of these young guys that are working out to be the strongest, it's okay. I was there one time, okay? <laughs> it wasn't even a joke. What is. <laughs> Uh, fame. I want to be. I want to be worshipped like God. Man, when you were on stage and you sang, you were awesome. Maybe you were. But that's not why you do that. Or it's about me. And if you're living your life and it's about me, you're probably, I hate to say this, an idolater. Anytime you do something good to get recognized by others, you're now committing idolatry because it's about people acknowledging you and not giving glory to God. You understand? It's very seductive, the gods of discontentment. If you're not content with Christ alone, you're beginning, your heart is moving to the wrong place and then you can be led to any place. So as the worship team comes up here and we wrap up, we want a reminder that it's all about the heart. For you and I today, for almost all of us, it's probably not about eating meat sacrificed to idols. For most of us, it's probably not about worshiping another god. For most of us, and many of us, it's probably not about trusting in an amulet, an idol, or seeking to appease a spirit, or wanting to be exalted as God. Instead, it's probably just about this simple message. It's about the heart. It's all about the heart of worship. So that's where I want to lead you right now for a closing minute. So we are going to sing here in a minute an oldie but a goodie. In the 90s, in Matt Redmond's church in England called Soul Survivor, this church had been instrumental in the worship uh, industry, for lack of a better term, they began to sense that there was some kind of dynamic that was missing in their church. And the pastor made a brave decision. He said, we are not going to... They shut down the sound system. <clears throat> they shut down the band. I'm not 
preaching this to you guys anyway. They shut down the band or the sound system. <clears throat> and they decided they would just sing a cappella for a period of time. <clears throat> Excuse me. And eventually, over time, they brought the band back and the sound back. But when they went a cappella, they realized maybe we're missing it. We're so caught up in this amazing worship that maybe we've missed the heart of worship. And it led Matt Redman then to write his lyrics. And the song begins, When the music fades, all is stripped away, and I simply come, longing just to bring something that's of worth that will bless your heart. Because I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you. Jesus, it's all about you. So we're going to sing Heart of Worship. Pastor Adam and Kenny are going to come up here in a minute, and we're going to give you an opportunity to respond. We'd love for you to come up front and respond, be prayed over. Come up the wide aisles, exit the narrow aisles. And when you come up, we want to ask, just come up and just bring a one word, if you could. What's your one word that God's saying you today? And we will lay hands on you, pray for you briefly. Your one word may be love. Last night, one woman's word was friendship. This morning, one word was health. It may be faith. It may be forgiveness. It may be surrender, as one shared this morning. It may be anxiety. It may be doubt. What's your one word that God's saying to you today? We want to pray for you. Just don't come up and say flu. You can stay in your seat. <clears throat> we have all morning. Let's stand. Let's pray. So, Lord, right now we come back to you. It's not about idols and icons and statues and false gods. It's not about me, myself, and I. It's about my heart. Is my heart in a place of worship, where I say, Jesus, it's all about you, and here's my struggle, and I'm going to give it to you, because no one can rescue me but you. You are the only one. You are the deliverer, and I'm asking you for help. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.